Okay, lesson, uh, lessons from the King's Ancient Wisdom for Modern Times. This is lesson two in that series. And uh, the title of this lesson, On the Edge of Greatness, King Saul, part number two. So we're studying the uh, lives of various kings in this series and uh, we're, we've begun with uh, the life of King Saul under the title, On the Edge of Greatness. And you know, I gave this title to, to our study of this particular king because Israel's first king, Saul, showed a lot of promise at the beginning. I mean, you know, this, this person here uh, could have really done some great things. Uh, as we saw last week, after his anointing as king by Samuel and the confirmation of his uh, rulership uh, by the people, uh, we see Saul kind of uh, uh, mobilizing the nation in order to defeat one of Israel's fearsome enemies, the Ammonites. Um, we even see Saul resisting the temptation to punish those within his own people who originally opposed his coronation and he spared their lives, you know, giving glory to God instead. You know, he was saying, this is not a day for recrimination, this is not a day for revenge, this is a day of victory, this is a day we give glory to God, <clears throat> demonstrating great wisdom at that moment. So we left off last week as the people were reaffirming their allegiance to Saul as king before God with joy and prayer and sacrifice. Uh, this heady time, would soon give way to darker periods as Saul would begin his slow descent into madness and loss. A really, a really sad story. So when we look at Saul's actions and his decisions as king, we begin to recognize a number of patterns that led to his eventual downfall. And I want to look at those as we begin the lesson this morning. The first pattern that we, uh, that we see is a pattern of disobedience. A pattern of disobedience. So let's read 1 Samuel chapter 13, beginning in verse one. It says, Saul was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he now reigned 42 years over Israel. Now Saul chose for himself 3,000 men of Israel, of which 2,000 were with Saul at, at Michmash, and in the hill country of Bethel, while 1,000 were with Jonathan at Gibeah of Benjamin. But he sent away the rest of the people, each to his tent. Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines that was in Geba, and the Philistines heard of it. Then Saul blew the trumpet throughout the land, saying, let the Hebrews hear. All Israel heard the news that Saul had smitten the garrison of the Philistines, and also that Israel had become odious to the Philistines. The people were then summoned to, Gaul, uh, to Saul rather, at Gilgal. So let's take a look at you know, what's going on here. The Philistines were the greatest and most powerful enemy uh, that the Israelites had. And in this uh, episode, Jonathan, Saul's son, uh, the prince and the heir to the throne, mounts a foolish attack on a garrison of Philistine soldiers and wins, a small victory. Now this provokes an all out war with the other nation and Saul Without any guidance, without any plan, um, Saul calls on the Israelites to prepare for war. I mean, there's a little skirmish that causes a problem. Instead of going to the Lord for help in prayer, going to Samuel for guidance or whatever, perhaps some diplomacy can be worked out. No, Saul, Saul you know, he blows the trumpet and he, he assembles the people for war. You know, he's coming off of a victory against the Ammonites. He's feeling pretty good, he's feeling pretty strong. So he figures, the Philistines, sure, let's, you want to fight, let's, let's fight. So uh, in verse five to eight, we continue to read. Now the Philistines assembled to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots. Remember how many people were with Saul? 2,000 with Saul, a couple of thousand, 1,000 with, uh, with his son. So here it says the Philistines, they assembled to fight 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and people like the sand which is on the seashore in abundance. And they came up and camped in Michmash, east of beth -Avon. When the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait, for the people were hard pressed, then the people hid themselves in caves and thickets and cliffs and cellars and in pits. Also some of the Hebrews crossed the Jordan into the land of Gad and Gilead but as for Saul, he was still in Gilgal, 
and all the people followed him trembling. Now he waited seven days according to the appointed time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal and the people were scattering from him. So very quickly, the Jews see that they are outnumbered and they are outmatched. And Saul, as he waited upon Samuel to seek God's help and blessings, noted that his forces were starting to run away. Remember, Samuel said, before you go out to war, you wait, you wait seven days and I will come, okay? And I will come offer a sacrifice or whatever to prepare the troops. So while Saul is waiting for you know, Samuel to show up, uh, a huge Philistine army you know, begins to encamp near him and around him and his own soldiers begin, you know, they're, they're abandoning him because they see how outmatched they are. So let's keep reading. It says, so Saul said, bring to me the burnt offering and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. As soon as he finished offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came and Saul went out to meet him and to greet him. But Samuel said, what have you done? And Saul said, because I saw that the people were scattering from me and that you did not come within the appointed days and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, therefore I said, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal and I have not asked the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. Samuel said to Saul, you have acted foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God which he commanded you, for now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not endure. The Lord has sought out for himself a man after his own heart, and the Lord has appointed him as ruler over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. And so he's afraid that he would lose his following. He disobeys Samuel, who told him to wait and he offers the sacrifice himself, which he was not allowed to do. He wasn't a priest. The kings were not allowed to offer sacrifice. And so Samuel shows up and rebukes him and tells him that because of his disobedience, God would send, some, God first of all would remove the kingdom from him and give it to someone who would obey him. Notice he didn't say someone stronger than you, a better tactician than you, a better manager than you. No, no, no. Someone who will obey, that's who will get the kingdom. So this pattern of disobedience to God's commands you know, would continue throughout his lifetime and he would never truly repent of it. So uh, uh, was everything lost? Well, no, not necessarily. He could have repented. You know? He could have gone to God and said, look, I, you know, I've, I've messed up, please. For, you know, he didn't do that. And so this, this pattern of, of, of uh, disobedience eventually led to a pattern of instability. Now I'm not going to read all of chapter 14, it's too many, too, much pass too many passages here for the time that we have, so I'll kind of summarize the story for you. In chapter 14, we see what happens after the disaster of the sacrifice offered by Saul instead of Samuel. Jonathan, his son, goes ahead and he attacks another small contingency of Philistine soldiers and he succeeds again in winning a small victory. Well, this sudden and unexpected defeat demoralizes the entire Philistine army to the point where they became afraid and vulnerable and ready to retreat. Now, we need to understand the background here a little bit. One of the reasons for this was that there were no swords or weapons in Israel at that time, since the Philistines controlled all the making and repair of iron-based tools and weapons. So if they needed to sharpen one of their implements for farming, they had to go to Philistine territory in order to have that done. They didn't have their own production of metal. Only the king and a few others had swords. So Jonathan and a few others, again, one of the few who possessed their own armor, um, uh, attack this, uh, this contingency here. So a defeat against an enemy that was supposedly, you know, had no weaponry, rattled the Philistines to the point of panic. They say, wow, if, if you know, we, we thought we were just going to attack this group and they had no weapons and all of a sudden we've lost two, you know, two garrisons to these people who have weapons. Uh, I, have a, I have a suspicion that the Lord was working at the, uh, in this as, as well. Nevertheless, the Philistines are panicked and they disappear. So while this was going on, 
Saul, undecided about what to do, makes a foolish oath forbidding his people to eat until a victory was in hand. Notice here, once again, he's using a spiritual thing, fasting, in order to achieve a strictly physical end, military victory. You know, he offered the sacrifice, Samuel rebukes him for doing this, and now he's not sure what to do, so he says, I'll know what to do. Everybody fasts until, they, until we win, you know, in order to gain God's favor in some way. So the problem with the fast is that it weakened his soldiers and his people uh, to the point where when the Philistines were demoralized and vulnerable, the Jews would, couldn't take advantage of it because they were too weak. They were too weak from hunger. They couldn't fight. Also, the people were so hungry that when they took the spoil left behind by the enemy that ran away, they ate the blood of the animals and they disobeyed God in the process. They had food laws, of course, and, but they were so hungry they ignored all of the food laws and just stuffed themselves because they were starved. And Jonathan, another interesting point here, Jonathan, who did not know of the oath to fast, ate some honey uh, in ignorance, and he had to be saved by the will of the people lest he be executed by his own father. You know? so, such was the confusion going on here. So in this episode, Saul showed how unstable his character was becoming. He, he showed his irreverence and arrogance when he offered the sacrifice. Uh, and then he committed his nation to an oath, both actions done without the guidance of the prophet or the approval of God. You know, he, was, he was king, yes, but he didn't have the power that the priest had. He didn't have the gift of the prophecy that Samuel had, and he didn't rely on that. So he didn't follow through with the Philistines. He had a chance to destroy them once and for all, but he fumbled the ball, costing the Israelites uh, many more battles with the Philistines uh, in the future. Yet despite this pattern of instability, God continued to give him success in his military campaigns. After all, God has an agenda too. And uh, he uses flawed people to carry out his agenda even though they are, they are flawed like, like Saul. So we can draw a couple of lessons from this. For example, you know, God can use you despite your flaws. And even under God's grace, sometimes you do suffer the consequences of your mistakes. You know, being a Christian doesn't mean that you don't suffer the consequences of some of your errors, some of your sins. And uncorrected sins and weaknesses tend to repeat themselves and they grow stronger and more pervasive with time. Now, this last lesson especially is true in Saul's life. So we see a, a pattern of disobedience, a pattern of instability, which in turn, leads to a, um, well, hang on a second, let me get to this, leads to a pattern of open rebellion. So disobedience to instability to open rebellion. Chapter, uh, 1 Samuel 15, verse uh, one, we'll read in a moment. So in chapter 15, we read about Saul's increasing disregard for the commandments of God. We don't have time again to read the story, so again, I'll summarize this uh, chapter for you. So for the time being, the Philistines are quiet and, and you know, they're licking their wounds, they're leaving the Israelites alone. Samuel comes to Saul with a message from God and the message is, go and destroy one of their old enemies, the Amalekites. This was a nation that had caused problems for the Jews while they wandered in the desert. Now Samuel specifically instructs Saul to completely wipe out the entire nation. And he says to him, quote, both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. In other words, this was to be a total annihilation of this nation and its animals. No trace of the Amalekites was to remain because God was judging them for their pagan religion and their opposition to his people in the past. So their time of judgment was at hand. Remember he said, you know, the cup of the Amalekites is not full yet. Well, now their cup was full, time for judgment. So Saul raises an army and he defeats the people militarily, but he doesn't do exactly as God commands. There's that pattern of disobedience again. He kept the king of the Amalekites alive and he spared the best of the flock 
of sheep and oxen. You know, he he kind of took the cream off the top, if you will. So what makes matters worse is that when he's confronted with the evidence of his disobedience by Samuel, Saul refuses to acknowledge his sin. And so we look at uh, verse 20. In verse uh, 15.3, in verse uh, 20, it says, Then Saul said to Samuel, I did obey the voice of the Lord, and I went on the mission on which the Lord sent me, and have brought back Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. And so he kind of rewords the command, if you wish, of God to make it comply with his actions. You know, God said, destroy everything. And then when Saul answers Samuel's accusation, he says, yeah, well, I, I, I did what God said. You know, they're, they're defeated, they're all dead, except for the king and the best of the animals and so on and so forth. Then in verse 24, we see him blaming the people for his sin. It says, then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I have indeed transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words because I feared the people and I listened to their voice. So he tries to reword the command, that doesn't work. Now he's going to blame somebody else for what he did. You know, he's saying, well, they pressured me into doing it. It was wrong, but it's not my fault. What's his problem? Well, he doesn't want to accept responsibility for his, for his actions, right? Somebody, I mean, he was the king. He was the king. In those days, this was, this was not a benevolent monarchy. If the king said, do this, that was it. And then in verse 30, he expresses sorrow, but only for the consequences of his sin. You know, worldly sorrow, not true spiritual sorrow. It says, then he said, I have sinned, but please honor me now before the elders of my people and before Israel, and go back with me that I may worship the Lord your God. So he's lost the respect of the people. He's afraid of that. He doesn't want to be rebuked publicly by Samuel and lose his grip on power. So he says, yeah, yeah, I sinned, I'm sorry, but come on back with me and pray with me. In other words, you know, stand up with me. Give me your approval in front of the people so that they will continue to give me their approval. Of course, Samuel pierces his denials and his defenses with the truth about what his sins really are. Let's read verse 23, he says, for rebellion is as the sin of divination and insubordination is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. So what are his sins uh, that uh, Samuel says? Well, rebellion for one, he says, rebellion is divination in the sense that you rely on some other source of power, in this case, self or others, or you seek out spirits instead of God's power. You know, it's the allegiance to power from below rather than power from above. It is the attempt to overthrow the balance and the order of God's power and institute another power in his place. You know, how, how does a king rebel? I mean, he's in charge. He can't rebel against the people. The people are supposed to be subordinate to him. Well, he's rebelling against the power that's above him, against God. That's rebellion. He's putting himself. You know, he's answerable only to himself. Then uh, Samuel says he's stubborn. Samuel equates stubbornness uh, to the sin of idolatry and wickedness. It's a direct refusal to submit to God's authority. You know, it's idolatry when it's done in ignorance. It's wickedness and iniquity when done despite knowing the truth. I'm going to repeat that. Stubbornness becomes idolatry when done in ignorance. But it's wickedness and iniquity when we know the truth, but we do our thing anyways. That's, God sees that as wickedness. And then thirdly, rejection. Refusing to follow the path that God has laid out for you in His word. This equals rejection of God. You refuse to do what God wants you to do or to follow the path that He's given to you. Uh, yeah, you've rejected God. So here Samuel lays out the final consequence. He will be rejected by God. 
So Saul had gotten to the point in his life where his arrogance makes him sin without thinking of the consequences or recognizing the nature of his sin. He's just, you know, he's in a pattern, he's unstable, he's just like a, you know, a bull in a china shop. You know, he just, everything he touches now is, is just going to uh, cause problems. So in the end, he doesn't see the price that his sins are costing him. Not just the respect of the people, but the complete loss of God's favor and the privilege of serving Him. And of course, uh, in another sense, the loss of the kingdom for His Son. As he, uh, we'll read later on, as he grows older, he begins thinking about passing the kingdom on to his son. And he's also jeopardized that as well. So we've seen a pattern of disobedience that leads to instability, that leads to rebellion. And then we see a pattern of fear in his life. As I said, disobedience leads to instability, which produces open rebellion. And, and these things in turn create this intense paranoia in him. He was too proud to repent, so he just forged ahead without, without God's blessing. And you know, this is a, a sure, sure recipe for depression and fear. So in chapter 16, we see that Saul is now violent and out of control. He threatens to kill anybody who opposes him. What a difference from the guy at the beginning who was hiding in the baggage area you know, and too shy to come forward to be acknowledged as king by the people. You know, he's come a long way from the time when God you know, called on him through Samuel and, and he was saying, oh, I'm from the least tribe and my family is the least family. You know, there was some humility there. Couldn't believe that he would be chosen as king. What a long way he's come from that particular personality. And how did he get there? Well, he was tested by God by being given a great responsibility. And his disobedience led to instability, led to rebellion, and now leads to his constant uh, paranoia. He's now become a ruler, keeping his position by force, not by grace. He rules only because God allows him to do so, but he's in fear. Fear from God's will and fear of God's purpose. So we see that he now begins to seek out secular things like music to soothe his troubled soul, right? You know, he's, he, he has the, he, he's, it says he's troubled by spirits, you know, a way of saying he's depressed, he's down, he's unstable, and his advisors you know, say, well, let's, let's find him someone who plays music and sings you know, that could soothe him. Instead of going to God in prayer, he, he turns to secular things in order to soothe his troubled soul. Again, rather than pouring out his heart in repentance to God. So Saul has rebelled against the Lord and he's attempting to rule without reference to God's will or direction. All right, so I'm going to stop here and, and we're going to draw some lessons now. But uh, uh, we're going to continue next week. Again, not a happy, not a happy scene. We just, we just watched this guy you know, just spiraling down, down, down. It's a sad story. I think most of us know how it ends. Pretty sad story. So uh, you know, there's a, there's a reason for this. It's not just that uh, the circumstances were difficult in his life. Uh, he began well. He had a great victory at the beginning. The respect of the people, the blessing of God. He had it all. He had it all. But the, the, the disobedience that he demonstrated when he was tested, and not in a great thing, God said, you know, wait, wait for the priest to come and offer the sacrifice. He couldn't wait. So sometimes you know, those small disobediences begin to you know, morph into larger ones. And there's also always consequences. The, the, the advantage of being able to read about Saul's life is we see his entire life and we can recognize the patterns in his life. We can't always do that in our own lives. You know? You know, hopefully we can look to the past and see if there are any patterns there that have led us to where we are today, good or bad. That's a good way also when we're in prayer, you know, to examine ourselves, to examine our lives you know, and see what are some of the things that have brought me to this point of success or this point of failure. You'll see it's a very helpful thing. So anyway, Saul's tragic life 
uh, is so full of important lessons for us, even though we live in a different era and a different position that he experienced. So a couple of lessons uh, from his uh, life. After all, the series is called Lessons from the King. So here's a couple of lessons. Lesson number one, success is no guarantee against judgment. Saul continued to reign. He continued to have the allegiance of the people. He continued to win military battles, nevertheless. But this was not because God was pleased with him. It suited God's overall purpose for the nation to keep him there and to protect the nation. But Saul's judgment was coming. So we mustn't judge our standing with God by how we feel you know, emotionally or how successful we are. We need to judge our standing with God by how obedient we are. That's the measure of success. You know, if, if, if success with God was based on you know, wealth, then all the stars in Hollywood would be going to heaven. <laughs> we could say that God is pleased with you know, the, the millionaire, uh, the millionaire uh, purveyors of pornography online, because those guys are making millions and millions of dollars you know, spewing their garbage on the internet. They're successful, they have beautiful homes, their kids go to private schools, they have nice cars, they're clean, they hobnob with you know, the elites. We don't measure our success with God with our success here on earth. What do we do when we have success here on earth? Well, we give thanks. If you're a believer, whatever good I have, I'm happy to give thanks to God. The ability to recognize what we have, that what we have comes from God, that's a wonderful blessing because the giving of thanks is what leads us to contentment. People say, you know, I just don't feel content or you know, I just don't have that feeling. And I ask them, how much time do you spend in prayer giving thanks, reviewing the blessings that you have and giving thanks for them? Well, you know, once in a while I, I give thanks at my meals I guarantee you, if you sat down and said, I'm only going to begin to give thanks just for the blessings that I have, and I'm going to start reviewing those, you won't, there's not enough time in the day. <laughs> you know, I, I give thanks because I'm able to blink. <laughs> I'm able to blink because there are some people that have eye disease problems, they cannot blink. You know, people have Bell's palsy, for example, they have to manually make their eyelid move the, because of the, the, uh, the trauma that that causes to their face. Imagine if you couldn't blink, if you had to do it manually, if you had to put drops in your eyes, people who've had eye surgery, didn't work real well, now they've got to put drops in their eyes every few hours. Imagine if that's what you had to do. That's just blinking. <laughs> Just blinking. I mean, we could go on with all the bodily functions. I think I'll spare you those. But you know, think, think, think just for a minute. If you couldn't breathe in and out, those people that have you know, breathing issues, serious asthma. I can, I can breathe deep. Thank you, Lord, for that. So if you start breaking down all your blessings, there are not, not enough hours in the day to give thanks for all of them. My point is, when we begin to cultivate a thankful heart, the, the outcome of that is that that leads us to contentment. We also enter into a more content state. See, the, the state of contentment is not achieved by getting more stuff. People think, well, if I just have more, if I have, just, you know, if I have a bigger this, bigger bank account, more money in the bank, more safety, more investments, whatever, I'll feel content. No, it doesn't work like that. The road to contentment is through a thankful heart, no matter what you have. So lesson number one, success, there's no guarantee against judgment. Lesson number two, obedience, is more important than ritual. In both the Old and New Testaments, God has ordained certain rituals that express deeper meanings and truths. 
For example, the sacrificing of animals to represent the result of sin and the need for atonement in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, baptism in water to express removal of impurity and the tra transition between the old life and the new life. Communion to represent and remember the body and the blood of Jesus offered in our stead. Those are rituals. Rituals are important and they're central to our religion, but they are not the substance of our religion. You see the difference? Obedience to God, this is what our faith is about. This is the story that our rituals tell. You know, some people think that performing the rituals of our faith in exact accordance to the Bible, this is what our religion is about. You know that we have the unleavened biscuits, crackers, you know, the matzah, and the grape juice, you know, that it's, and that we have first, we have first the bread and then the wine. I remember once in, a, in an assembly there was a young guy who was presiding at the Lord's table and he was nervous, it was his first time, and, it, and he was standing there like this with the, with the communion tray, with the, the fruit of the vine, you know, and he was waiting for the prayer you know, and he was nervous and he started twirling the, you know, started twirling the, uh, the tray. <laughs> and the communion you know, was falling down on him and I mean it was like a panic. People were going nuts like he had set off a nuclear bomb. You know? Another time at a, at a big uh, you know, lectureship, uh, we were having a communion on a Sunday morning. Again, there was a guy who was up there very nervous, not used to this. He said the prayer, you know, Lord, you know, bless the elements and so on and so forth. And he picked up the communion tray and handed out the communion first. In other words, the fruit of the vine, he distributed that first before he did the, the bread. And everybody was like, oh no, oh, we're going to die. You know, God's going to send a thunderbolt down and kill us because we, we took the fruit of the wine before we took the bread. Really? Like I said, some people think that performing the ritual of our faith in exact accordance to the Bible, this is what we're about. And eventually we make the ritual our God and, 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 and sacrifice our time and our love and our passion to the promotion of its repetition of the ritual. But rituals are important, but only in the sense that they represent our daily effort to obey God and follow His will for our lives. You know, Saul thought he could cover his disobedience with an elaborate and expensive sacrifice. He excused his disobedience by claiming that he kept the animals alive so he could offer sacrifice to God, but God had told him to destroy all of these, not to keep them for sacrifice. And Samuel, you know, he cut to the heart of the matter when he said to Saul, has the Lord, um, uh, has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, 1 Samuel 15, verse 22. Hey, I'm not saying let's do away with communion. No, of course not. These are things given to us by God. We can't eliminate these things. And I'm not saying they're not important. They are important. I'm not saying it doesn't matter how we do them. Yes, it does matter how we do them. We have instructions from the scriptures you know, on how to do these things. But these things, these are not the weighty matters of the law. These are not the substance of our faith, that we come here and have the crackers and the juice on Sunday. This is not the substance of our faith. The substance of our faith is that we obey God and that we love each other in the way God loves us. That's the substance of our faith. When we get the substance of our faith right, then the rituals have meaning. <laughs> you know? If we're loving each other, then coming together for communion is true communion. We are sharing one body. We are together grateful for the blood of Christ. And we demonstrate that belief and that gratitude in the way that we love one another. 
and serve one another. So you know, let's keep the right things in perspective here. Lesson number three, excuse me. Lesson number three, there's always hope. Always hope. Even after Saul disobeyed the first time in the matter of the sacrifice, God gave him another chance with the campaign against the Amalekites. Who knows if God would have not spared Saul if he would have done right the second time around. And God kept him alive and on the throne for 32 years, 1 Samuel 13, 1. And at any time Saul could have repented, he could have asked God to redirect his way. He didn't do it. You know, many times it's not our sins that defeat us, it's our refusal to ask God for help to change. That's what defeats us. You know, the one who made the moon and the stars, can he not change a man's heart? Can he not help us to overcome certain obstacles? Saul didn't avail himself of God's mercy, not because the mercy wasn't there. No, he didn't, avail of God's, he didn't receive God's mercy because he didn't ask for it. He didn't ask for it. So there's always hope despite our failures. God wants to give us a second chance. We just have to ask for it. Because I firmly believe that He is the God of hope and He's the God of love and He's the God of mercy, the King of mercy. If we would just ask in humble obedience. Okay, well there's just too much left in Saul's life to kind of try to squeeze it all here in the last three minutes. So we'll, we'll stop here and we'll, uh, we'll uh, wrap up this part of our series on lessons on the kings next time. All right, thanks for your attention.